OK, so now that I've set that foundation, I want to come to the title of this talk, which is I wanted to give a talk tonight on the future of being human. And specifically, what I'm interested in is the ways that our technology will be able to change our Umwelt, and thereby the experience of being human. And, and to tell you this story, I'm going to try not to extrapolate wildly. I'm just going to talk about things that are happening right now, except for my last two slides. Those will be wild extrapolations. But I'm just going to talk about, I'm just going to talk about things that are happening right now where our technology has the opportunity to greatly expand our Umwelt and what that means to be a human. So, as many of you are aware, there are hundreds of thousands of people now that are walking around with artificial retinas and artificial inner ears. Um, so essentially these are implanted CCD chips behind the retina or, or, uh, or, or digital microphones um, with, for the inner ear. These are digitally sampling information from the world and then passing this information along to cells at the back of the eye or, or in the inner ear. Now these work to, this doesn't give anything new in the umwelt, it just restores lost parts of the umwelt. But what these have shown, these have been amazing proofs of principle that we can marry our technology to our biology. But here's the critical point. As recently as 15 years ago, a lot of scientists thought that these wouldn't work, that there was no way it was going to work. Why? Well, it's because the way that these digital CCD chips and digital microphones work, they're speaking a language and talking to the brain in a language that's not the same language as our natural sensory organs. In other words, even though we're plugging this stuff right into the brain, a lot of people thought this ain't going to work because it's speaking the language of, of Silicon Valley rather than speaking the language of, of, of biology. But you know what? The incredible part is it turned out not to matter because the brain figured it out just fine. It figured out, okay, there are these incoming signals. They're somehow correlated with information in the outside world. I get it. I'll figure out what to do with this. Okay, well, that's amazing. And to understand how the brain does that, keep in mind that the brain is locked in silence and darkness in the vault of your skull. The brain never sees or hears anything. All it ever sees are electrical signals coming in along different uh, you know, fiber bundles. And that's all the brain ever has to work with, is this sort of this electrochemical information that's moving around. And what the brain's amazingly good at is being very flexible and figuring out, OK, well, that I, you know, I can tell that this is correlated with that, and it extracts information out of these patterns of activity coming in along these cables, and it just figures out what to do with the information. And so, as incredible as it is that people can see with artificial retinas and artificial cochleas, inner ears, it's equally as remarkable that you can see with this retina and this your natural inner ear. All your brain's ever seeing are these patterns of electrical activity coming in, and that's all it ever gets and it literally lights up the world. Okay, so here's the thing. The brain is so remarkably flexible at this that you can plug in all kinds of different information sources and it'll just figure this out. And this led me in my next book that's coming out next year called Live Wired, this led me to propose what I call the MPH model of evolution. And I don't want to get too technical here, but MPH stands for Mr. Potato Head. And, <laughs> and the idea is, the idea is that all of these sensory devices that we know and love, our eyes, our ears, our fingertips, and so on, these are just peripheral plug-and-play devices. To the brain, all these are are ways of interfacing with the world, and you just plug them right in, and the brain will figure out what to do with that information. And when you look across the animal kingdom, what becomes clear is that there are all kinds of plug-and-play devices. So, for example, with snakes, they have, they have heat pits, and that's how they pick up on the infrared. For the, for the, for the knife fish that I told you about earlier, um, it generates and detects uh, electrical signals. So it's got these electroreceptors built into it, which we don't have, and that's uh, a plug-and-play device. Its brain figures out what to do when it gets electroreception. This is an animal called the star-nosed mole. It lives in the dark, it burrows around, and its nose is essentially 20 fingers 
and it feels around in the dark. It moves around in the dark, and it feels with these 20 figures. That's a really bizarre plug-and-play device. But there it is, and the star-nosed mole brain figures out what to do with it and how to read the information off of that. Um, birds and whales and cows, they all have magnetite in them. They've got magnetite, and they can align themselves to the magnetic field of the planet that way and orient by that. We don't have magnetite, but they do, and their brain just figures out what to do with it. It's just a plug-and-play device. And so back to the Mr. Potato Head model, what this means is that whatever sensors you have for picking up on signals in the world, that's what you get to experience as your reality. And, and the lesson that surfaces here is that there's nothing special or fundamental about our eyes and ears and nose and fingertips and all the things that we're used to. It's just that we have inherited these from a long, complicated road of evolutionary history. This just happens to be what we get as our plug-and-play devices, and that determines how we experience our reality.